my name's Tim, and this is Marmar, and we're going to bring you a short song that we've written called Goshen. Um, actually came forth in a young adult's prayer meeting, and really what it says and what it speaks about is how whenever the Israelites were under the Egyptians in captivity, and you know the plagues were coming against the Egyptians, that they were in a safe space, that they were in a protected place because they were the people of God. That place that they lived was called Goshen, and even whenever death was coming to every single door, they had the blood on their doors, and that prevented death from entering. And we don't just have an earthly lamb, we actually have an eternal lamb whose name is Jesus, and we're covered in his blood. So as we sing this, I encourage you, you know, be encouraged about your authority to declare this, to decree this over your home, that there's no lack, there's no um, fear in your home, that we are securely and confidently found under that blood. Amen? I'm under the blood, the blood of the Lamb. land under the blood, the blood of the Lamb. I live in Goshen. I walk in the promised land under the blood. Fear stood up and shouted, the plague is at the door. When your spirit rose within me to say, I live in Goshen. I walk in the promised land under the blood, the blood of stood up and shouted the plague is at the door when your spirit rose within me to say no matter what comes the fear stood up and shouted the plague is at the door when your spirit rose within me to say
Good morning everyone, my name is Stuart Elliott, ex Northern Ireland international footballer and also one of the elders here at the Way Church in Ballyclare. I believe in every Christian's life there should be a volume one and a volume two. What you were before you came to meet Jesus and then what Jesus has done in your life since knowing him personally. I want to tell you a bit about both this morning. I grew up in a very big family, one of ten, seven sisters, two brothers and a mum and dad who loved all of their children. From a very early age, my love was for football. Dreamt of playing for one of the great Glen Torn teams. The distant dream was to play for a Scottish or English league team. And the ultimate dream was to play for my country one day, Northern Ireland at Windsor Park. My football dream started to materialise in primary seven when I represented our primary school, Mersey Street, at the Greater Belfast Trials, which brought the best two boys from County Antrim and County Down together. And from what was probably 200 boys, I made it into the last 15 and went on to represent Belfast Schools on the mainland. And then at the end of the year, was awarded the Belfast Schools Player of the Year that particular year. Leading on from that, a, a, a knock came to my door one night. It was a man called Joe Kincaid, who was the chief scout for a little club in Scotland called Rangers. And he asked my dad, could I come over and play for the Northern Ireland champion St Andrews on the Shankill Road? And I'd heard about this club, so my little heart started to beat that bit faster. So excited because I knew this was a stepping stone then into the professional ranks. For my sins, I also joined Manchester United School of Excellence. And I often say that's against my religion because I'm a Liverpool supporter. <clears throat> and folks, all this was taking place. By the time I was making the transition from primary school into secondary school. And as I often say, life could have been much better for me. Good friends, good family 
and now good football prospects, but one Saturday afternoon a tragedy hit my family. On my way home from an amateur league game with a friend of mine called Paul Lehman, I was going back down Mersey Street where I lived and Paul's auntie came out of one of the side streets and she said to me, Stuart, you need to rush on home. And I knew by the look in this lady's face that I needed to prepare for the worst. I got to the end of Mersey Street, I see my uncle, and he broke the news to me that my dad, who was just 49 years of age, had taken a massive heart attack on the Craigie Road in Belfast, and he was dead before he hit the ground. That was devastating for me because my dad was my biggest fan and he was the breadwinner in our home. And I remember going round to my little house and seeing people come in and consoling my mum, my other brothers and sisters. And the reality for me that my dad had gone forever just would not hit home. And then it finally did when the funeral had taken place. The takeaway from the tragedy of losing my dad, I decided to pursue this football dream and went on to win two Northern Ireland Championships with St Andrews, the Rangers Nursery Club from the age of 13 to 15. And then at 15, another disappointment came my way um, when other boys were getting apprenticeships to go on to the mainland, some even the Irish League clubs. I was told that I was underdeveloped and wasn't going to make it into the, the next step into the professional ranks. And that devastated me because I dreamt of being a professional footballer. And so here I was from 15 to 16, my life heading in no real direction. My father's gone. My football dreams now collapsed and my future's left uncertain because I'm leaving Ashfield Boys School without a single qualification. And it was during those days that I asked myself this question and perhaps you're asking yourself this question. I asked myself, what is life really all about? Folks, it was a year later that I came to know the raison d'etre, as they say, the reason for living. And I found that to be in God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's volume one. That's before I became a Christian. Let me tell you a little about my conversion and then I'll tell you a bit about my football career and what God did through that. Laying in my bed one August sunny morning, 1995, a knock comes on my bedroom doors. My young cousin, Glenn. Glenn asks me if I want to come round because to, to King George V playing fields because the White Whale Church were having an evangelistic outreach and my immediate response was, Glenn, I don't want to associate myself with those Christians. And anyway, I need to find myself a job after just leaving school. And Glenn, knowing how to draw me, says they're giving away free cheeseburgers around there and cans of Coke. And folks, I was ready before you could say boo. I had no interest in Christianity. I just wanted a free cheeseburger and a can of Coke. Isn't that amazing how God can draw you? But I went around to that field and I often say I seen something in those Christian people at that time that I knew my mates on the street corners did not have. And I began to inquire about what it was that they had because I knew I desperately needed it. And I remember in the evening sitting with those young men who were looking after the tent mission in their caravan and they began to tell me that they didn't have so much religion as they had a relationship with a living Jesus. And they said, Stuart, if you can give the Lord Jesus your heart, then he can do for you what he's done for us. And God, the Holy Spirit, started to speak to me during those days. I remember got my football dream back on track. Paul Lehman had invited me to play for Glen under 17s. And after the training sessions, what I would usually have done was left Inverary, walk right along the Black Path, down, turn left into Parkgate uh, with my mates. But instead of going left after the training sessions, I found myself going right to stand in this field. And when I got there, I listened to Pastor James McConnell from the Whitewell Church preach the gospel with all of his heart. And he told me how Jesus was the only saviour. And if I wanted to get to heaven, then I had to put my trust and my faith in him and repent of my sins. And this man made it quite clear that when it came to Jesus Christ, there was no sitting on the fence. I was either for him or I was against him. And my life was at a crossroads. I had a decision to make. Stuart Elliott, are you going to go back onto the street corners with your mates and do what you've always done? Are you going to follow the crowd? Are you going to turn, repent of your sins, heed this gospel call and walk the way of the cross? It was the crowd of the cross. There was no in between. I'm ashamed to say that for three weeks I put off making my decision. Perhaps because of peer pressure. Worrying what my mates would say. But I remember after that church wrapped up, every night I was left with the question, what are you going to do about these Christians and about their God? My uncle knew that I was under conviction. 
So he put me in the car Sunday night after Sunday night for the next three weeks to take me over to that same church. And I remember coming through the doors and receiving a warm welcome from these Christians at about 10 handshakes before I sat down on a seat. I remember looking at the balconies and seeing men and women lifting their hands and passion, passionately wor worshipping their God and you know, outwardly mocking them a little, saying, look at the state of your man over there to my little cousin. You'll never get me becoming one of those. And knowing that it was only a matter of time before I became a Christian, because inwardly, I admired them. And it was the 3rd of September, 1995, sitting on the right-hand side of the balcony in the Whitewell Church. Folks, I couldn't even tell you what the pastor was preaching on that night. I just knew I needed saved. I knew I wanted to come to Jesus. And so when the appeal went out, I lifted my hand in the balcony to say I wanted to become a Christian. And the story that's famous now throughout Northern Ireland, further afield, is that Pastor McConnell looks up into the balcony talking about me and says, there's a lovely young lady up there who wants to become a Christian. And I was mortified because, you see, I thought I was God's answer to girls. Um, long hair at the time, taking sunbeds, blue velvet jackets and all of that. And here he mistakes me for being a girl. It was a very humble experience. But folks, in amongst the laughter, there was tears of joy because I left that church that night and I had what we call a born again experience. And someone said, well, Stuart, what did it feel like? Well, I can say to you that it was marvellous. And one thing that I did know that night is I left that church knowing that I was a new creation in Jesus Christ. And as I looked upon the cross, metaphorically speaking, and seeing God's son die in my room and in my stead, I knew I was never going back to my old life, that I was going to live this Christian life 150% for him because I seen a God who was given 150% for me at the place called Calvary. And you know, folks, that's what marks Judah's life from that night forward, a wholehearted living for Jesus Christ. God was about to take my young life and do something tremendous with it. Inside a year, after becoming a Christian, I went from the Glenporn fourth team to the first team, scored on my debut, went on to win 10 major trophies with Glentoran under the management of Roy Coyle, one Irish League, two Irish Cups, and all the minor trophies twice over. Um, I was their top scorer three out of the five seasons that I was there. And in the last season there, I was runner-up to Northern Ireland Footballer of the Year. And a certain David Moyes was supposed to sign me for Preston, but the deal fell through. And I remember I was bitterly disappointed and going home and praying to the Lord and asking him, would he open a door for me that no man can shut? It was a short while later that Roy Coyle phoned me and said that Motherwell Football Club in Scotland had been watching me and put a bit of £120,000 in for my signature. And his words were, we need the money, so you need to go. <laughs> now, there was a four-day window about making the transition from Belfast to Lanarkshire. And I remember going up the coast, Port Ballantoy, and standing out on one of the rocks overlooking the Irish Sea. And I prayed this prayer. I said, Lord, you've opened this door for me. Now I'm going over into what they call full-time football with all of these so-called stars. And I do not want to hide my light under a bushel. I want to shine for Jesus. You know, folks, God heard that prayer. I arrived in the Motherwell changing room, Andy Gorham, Rangers of Scotland legend, John Spencer, Chelsea legend, Lee McCullough, ex-Rangers captain, um, Robert Martinez, who's now the Belgian manager, all of these so-called stars. And John Spencer pulls this Buddhist statue out of his bag and he says, fellas, I'm a practicing Buddhist and I would like you to pledge your allegiance to Buddha today. And I said, oh Lord, you really did hear that prayer. And when he came to me, he said, Stuart, rub Buddha's head. And I said, Shh. John, I cannot do that. And he says, well, why not? I says, because I believe what you're holding in your hand is an idol. I have to let you all know that I'm a Christian. I serve a risen Jesus Christ. And there was gas around the chain room said, he's one of those Christians. But you know, God marked that. The Bible says, those that are will of the honour me, I in turn will honour. And I say this to the glory of God. It's no coincidence that over the next two years, my testimony went right throughout the main belt of Scotland, both in the national papers and from church to church, seeing young and old come to Jesus Christ. I finished their top scorer, both seasons running, and had 13 international caps for Northern Ireland, my country. I remember my time at Motherwell was coming to a close. I had this great event at the football stadium called Encounter at the Well, and there was over 2,000 supporters showed up that night. And I remember... 
We presented the gospel through sports and at the end of the night I preached this message from Ecclesiastes chapter 11. And this is it. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth. Let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your own heart and in the sight of your own eyes. And what the Lord was saying through Solomon in Ecclesiastes 11 there was, live for pleasure, live for sin, leave God out of your plans if you must. But it finished by saying, know that for all of these things you choose to do, one day God may bring you into judgment or will surely bring you into judgment. And I spoke to especially the young people that night about how they ought to remember their creator in the days of their youth before these latter days come and there's no time for repentance. And praise God, there was 35 people responded to the gospel. Now, why do I tell this story as part of my testimony? Because in amongst those 35 people, there was a pastor's son there that night who three weeks later, after becoming a Christian at that event, was tragically killed in a car accident. I found this out two years after that event, that his dad sent a message to me to say, son, thank you that you preached the whole gospel that night because my son went out into eternity. He was taken before his time, but I knew that he was right with God. Do you know what it teaches us, folks? That we're not to put off to tomorrow what we know we can do today. Now, my time at Motherwell after that event had come to a close. I knew that they were selling me on and I began to seek God for his direction. And I wanted to see how God was leading my young life. I remember saying to my wife shortly after that, it wouldn't surprise me if God was to take us to Hull in East Yorkshire. And you, you say, well, why would you say that? Well, you see, I was part of the Whitewell Church in Belfast. There was another daughter church in Falkirk. And there was another affiliated church in England. Can anybody tell me where it was? It was in the city of Hull. And so a few weeks afterwards, Terry Butcher, whilst I'm doing a prayer walk, he was my manager, he calls me in. He says, Stuart, of all the clubs in England have put a bid in for your signature, Hull City in Yorkshire have put a bid in of £220,000. We need the money and you need to go. <laughs> and I knew it was God's will for me to go to Yorkshire. See how God was leading my life? I arrived in Hull City, it's the it's a city that's had, the team had been had had not a promotion in nineteen years, and new chairman Adam Pearson had come in and he was investing millions upon millions of pounds in this UKC stadium and more millions in, in bringing the teams up through the divisions and um, to get to the promised land as they say and. But after six months, Jan Moby, my manager, gets the sack and the chairman, ready to move into this big stadium, he says, uh, he calls me into his porta cabin, he says, Stuart, um, my investment is going down the drain. Can you tell me what's going wrong? And I said to him, Mr. Chairman, I don't have all the answers, but what I do know is that God has brought me to this city for a purpose. And in the next couple of years, you're going to see that stadium filled and you're going to get your investment back again. And he looked at me and said, to see, you must be crazy. Folks, I went down the, the stairs of that porta cabin that day, put my head on the steering wheel and said, Lord, why do I say stupid things like that to people? Now I've really put myself under pressure to deliver. And God, the Holy Spirit, spoke to me and said, Son, if you will honour me here in Yorkshire the way you did in Lanarkshire and the way you did in Belfast, I will show the people of the seventh biggest city what I can do through a young man who's willing to surrender to me. Folks, I say this to the glory of God. Is that any coincidence after not having a promotion in what, 19 years, that we go on to win two promotions in two years? I finished their top score three out of the five seasons I was there. And in the last promotion winning season, I won the golden boot across all the English divisions, scoring 29 goals, even beat Terry Henry. It's not bad that sure, it's not. <laughs> now what meant most to me as I come to a close? The applause, the fans, the trophies, the fame, not on your life. What meant most to me is that I would go down that wing at that stadium in front of 25,000 people on a Saturday afternoon and out of the stands I could hear this song, Simon and Garfunkel's song, and it changed the words of it. And all the fans were singing this, here's to you, Stuart Elliott, Jesus loves you more than you will know. And I loved that. Do you know why? Because it told me above all else that everybody in that city knew exactly who I stood for and what I stood for. They knew that I was a Christian. If you go back to Hull City today and mention Stuart Elliott's name, what I'm really proud of is that some will say, yes, he was a great footballer, 
but others will say there's a young man who was not ashamed to stand for Jesus Christ. And we've seen many, both young and old, come to Christ in that city. Pinnacle of my career as I close was playing for my country, Northern Ireland. Won 38 international caps, scoring four goals. Was part of one of the most successful teams in our recent history under Laurie Sanchez. Um, played in some of the greatest stadiums in the world, Old Trafford, in, in front of 80,000 people. Against some of the greatest players in the world, Cristiano Ronaldo and such like. But the greatest night in my footballing career, I have to say, was beating England 1-0 um, in 2005. It was the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow for me. God had given me the desires of my heart. I remember the Saturday before scoring the free kick against Azerbaijan and um, 15,000 testimonies. This testimony was given out in CD form at Windsor Park. My testimony in the Evangelist magazine was put on every seat at Windsor Park. It was a real evangelistic outreach even the Saturday before the England game and then I scored the winner. That Saturday night I got to give my testimony to the hierarchy of UEFA and the IFA at the Methodist Church in Portadown and I preached the gospel with all of my heart. God was doing tremendous things and then the England game came about. It was a moment of destiny. We all know what happened. David Healy scored that famous goal. I remember going around the stadium after the match, all the Ulster flags flying, you know, everybody singing such joy. Unless you'd been out there, you'd never understand how that felt. Reach the pinnacle, folks. I remember going into the tunnel. The England players are fighting with each other. We went into the changing room. Laurie Sanchez is congratulating all the players. The press are coming in and out. And do you know what I did, folks? After reaching the top, I took a moment by myself in the corner of the changing room at Windsor Park and I thought about the wee boy from East Belfast who at 13 lost his father, who at 15 football dream collapsed, 16 future uncertain, leaving school without any qualifications. And I thought about the night at 17 on the 3rd of September 1995 that I made the greatest decision in my life to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And I could say after reaching the top, and I can still say even this morning, that God had been faithful to me every step of the way. And I say this of a truth, Stuart Elliott's testimony is not the testimony of an extraordinary talented footballer. I want you to hear this, especially for teenagers and young men and women. I want you to hear this. Stuart Elliott's testimony is the testimony of a very ordinary young man who at 17 came to meet an extraordinary saviour and he has been leading me every step of the way. Folks, you know my prayer for every one of you is today? It's in these troubled times that God would continue to bless you, whether you're a Christian or whether you're not, even in his common grace that he bless you. We're all chasing something. Maybe you're in secondary school, maybe you're in college, maybe you're in university, you're chasing your dreams. Maybe it's a job, maybe it's something to do with your family. Folks, can I ask you, see in the midst of chasing that dream, that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, do not leave Jesus Christ on the sidelines. Because I tell you, you regret it, not just in this life, but you regret it for all of eternity. And if you're a Christian and you're pursuing your dreams at the expense of giving your Saviour half of your life, don't, don't do that, friend. Let this testimony inspire you to live wholeheartedly for Jesus Christ. The same Jesus that changed my life in the Whitewell Church on the 3rd of September 1995 is the same Jesus that can change your life. Especially I want to talk to teenagers and young men and young women today. He can change your life and what he done for me, he can do for you. And may God bless every one of you.